My name is Kate Chester, and I'm the Public Relations Manager for PCC. Thank you all for coming today. Um, today's uh, event uh, was organized by Brian Hull, who is sitting there in the middle of the room. This is a part of PCC's internationalization initiative, so thank you for participating in this. We're delighted um, to welcome Dr. Sopal Ear today to PCC. Um, he is going to be speaking on international aid and uh, the, how it threatens development, development and democracy in Cambodia specifically. Um, Dr. Ear is an assistant professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. His research interests include post-conflict reconstruction, stability, transition, uh, in, specifically in Southeast Asia, the political economy of governance, foreign aid, development, and growth, and again, specifically in Cambodia. Uh, he's, he is an author of two books, which you'll see here at the front. His most recent one is The Hungry Dragon, and the book next to that is what he'll be focusing primarily on today, and that's Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. And specifically, it questions one of the basic assumptions of current international practice, how international aid affects developing countries. Um, Dr. Ear earned his PhD in political science at UC Berkeley. He has three master's degrees, two of which are from Berkeley as well, one in agricultural and resource economics, and one in political science. And he also has a master's in public affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. So it's a delight to have him here with us today. I think you'll learn a lot. We had lunch with him earlier, and he has a wealth of information to share. So um, listen to him, think of questions to ask, and then engage later on in the session. Thank you so much, and welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, thanks everybody for, for coming here today. I, um, it's a real pleasure to speak uh, here today at uh, PCC. I, and thank you, Brian, for making this possible. We've been uh, communicating for months about making this uh, a reality, and this has been just a wonderful experience. Um, so I, I want to share with you some of the ideas from my book and uh, have a discussion with you. So uh, the book is um, Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. But the title of this talk is really more about how foreign assistance undermines democracy, which is the reversal of the title of the book, Aid Dependence in Cambodia and Beyond. And I want to touch other countries uh, beyond Cambodia, so that's what I'll do. But first, let me just provide you some context. I, so I teach at the school here, the Naval Postgraduate School, and um, I um, teach uh, junior military officers who um, have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And they, uh, they're very good at breaking things. Uh, they're very good at, at destroying uh, property. Uh, what they're doing in my classes is they're trying to learn about how to rebuild countries after conflict. And they always want to know about the A through Z list of how to rebuild countries. So sort of the uh, uh, nation building for dummies uh, version of, of, of you know, post-conflict reconstruction. And I often have to tell them that the work that they do is uh, not like this. It's not like a blueprint where, uh, you know, these are architectural plans and you're going to make a house, you're going to build a house from the ground up, that rebuilding a country is much more complicated, even if you can do this in terms of uh, putting together uh, a diagram of every possible relationship between uh, sort of uh, populations, the government, the capacity, and why the Taliban is doing what it's doing in terms of counterinsurgency dynamics. This was a slide made famous in a death by PowerPoint uh, article in the New York Times. It's a real slide. It actually is supposed to say something, but, but it, it, it's very difficult, and you, you, get, you get to the point where what, what is going on here, basically. So the metaphor that I often tell them uh, the work that we do is a lot more like is gardening. Uh, gardening as metaphor because uh, the weather changes when you garden and, and uh, it might rain one day, it might be sunny and I'm told it's beautiful and it's very unusual today and yesterday was also lovely but you know only the people who live here know best what, what the weather is like and only the people who live wherever the international development work or the reconstruction takes place uh, know best what's, what it's like on the ground. So it might require pruning, it might require doing things that only people there know. So 
what I want to communicate in this is this illusion of control, right? So we have, uh, gardeners have no illusion of control. We create the right growing conditions, nurture a healthy soil life, set up our lifestyle so we have time to tend our crops, and we plant a diverse variety of sturdy, healthy plants and watch them grow. We adjust as we go along, removing excess weeds, mulching, watering and fertilizing when necessary, and picking off pests, but ultimately the end result almost always includes crop failures and unexpected successes, and we feel more like stewards, sometimes even observers, than masters of our domain. So that's what I tell them, and of course, they have to listen to a guy who actually does this to his plants. So I, I really have to give you a warning that uh, the caveat is I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible gardener. So, so uh, you've been warned. Now, a few, uh, last year, there was a piece in The Economist that uh, quoted me saying, no less than the act itself, the politics of genocide can be heartbreaking. And, you know, this is... This, is, uh, this was a wonderful opportunity for me to share some ideas from my own life and from uh, the experience of Cambodia. And I've been very honored and blessed throughout my life. I I've, I've was selected as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum in 2011. I was elected to the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, but I could never have imagined uh, this back in the early 1990s when uh, I was actually in high school uh, right here uh, from the... Uh, I think, it w I, think, I think this is fr from freshman year, yeah, uh, yearbook, and that I would take uh, c classes from a community college in the Bay Area called Laney College in the summers. Uh, so really, I've, I've been where you are, and I think it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity when you get to take classes that inspire you and that motivate you to then go on to bigger and better things. So, uh, you know, maybe Japanese animations, uh, a club and, 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 and more prom pictures and things like that. But, but becoming an author and speaking to you to here today is really an honor. And, and, and really, to be here at PCC, to get this opportunity to see this beautiful campus is, is amazing. So why am I interested in Cambodia? I, I want to give you some context as to the reason for my interest, right? So I mentioned I'm, I'm originally from Cambodia. In 2009, I don't know how many of you are familiar with TED. Uh, TED Talks, right, videos, conference. So I had a chance to give a TED Talk, and it went online, and it was the story of my family's escape from the Khmer Rouge, essentially my mom's cunning uh, and determination to get her five children, uh, including myself, out of Cambodia during, during that period of time. And the great thing about that talk was that she actually was there uh, at the end. Uh, she got a, a standing ovation uh, from the audience. Uh, my wife, pregnant, uh, uh, with our first child, please have a seat right here if you'd like, um, uh, was also there in the audience. Uh, and there were some other very important people in the audience as well. I know he lives in the state up north. But, uh, but yeah, uh, it was a great opportunity to, 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 to share some of, the, some of the stories from our lives. And uh, the, I had the feeling that my mom would not perhaps get to do another trip with me maybe go on, on another adventure, because she was getting older, and little did I know how right she was, because six months later, she passed away. And it really got me to think about her legacy and the things uh, that she left behind that, that would be of value to myself and my own children. So uh, Cambodia is the reason why uh, we ended up uh, leaving uh, because of, of what was going on there politically. And in 1969, here my mom and dad are enjoying a, a summer uh, or a... a a nice outing somewhere, and we lived in a house that uh, I got the chance to visit a few years ago that now um, is home to 10 families in the home. So uh, it was taken over by 10 families, and, and it's, it's, it's now the property of others. And why? Because of, of war and conflict. Cambodia during this time was known as the Pearl of Asia and an island of peace. And even the founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, visited Cambodia. Here he's visiting the uh, prince, uh, head of state of, of Cambodia, uh, Noradam Sihanouk, uh, to learn more about nation building. Um, Phnom Penh was and remains a, a beautiful architectural uh, marvel, uh, and movies like The Little Prince played in Cambodia, starring none other than Prince Sihanouk himself. But across the world, uh, President Richard Nixon was pointing to Cambodia, and uh, in 1970, he uh, actually had this to say about Cambodia. There are no American combat troops in Cambodia. Uh, there are no American combat advisors in Cambodia. There will be no American combat troops or advisors in Cambodia. 
we will aid Cambodia. Cambodia is the Nixon doctrine in its purest form. Uh, and what did this mean, of course? What this meant was that B-52s would be dropping their payload on Cambodia. And uh, if you don't come to democracy, democracy will come to you sometimes. Uh, so uh, much of Cambodia had, um, uh, well, 113 thousand uh, bombs were dropped on Cambodia, more tons of bombs than in all of yeah, World War II Europe and uh, including Nagasaki and Hiroshima's atomic bombs. So not too surprisingly, on April 17, 1975, Phnom Penh, the capital, fell. And uh, the group that won, the Khmer Rouge, entered the capital and they were young people who were pissed off. Uh, they wanted to take back control of society and they had been told that urban dwellers like my family were the problem and the violence soon followed thereafter. So they began to evacuate a city of more than two million people in three days and including my family, we all went out of Phnom Penh uh, in different directions to occupy rural areas. This, this exodus was the cause of the first uh, thousands of deaths which eventually led to many millions. So um, here a forced labor camp, the leaders of the Khmer Rouge in this picture here riding a train, Pol Pot on the left, uh, never actually faces trial in the end or faces justice. He dies in his sleep after having been put under house arrest by his own comrades. To give you an idea of what Cambodia was like, um, I, I like to use this quote from Michael Paternity. Uh, Once upon a time there was a regime so evil that it created an anti-society where torture was currency and music, books, and love were abolished. Uh, this regime ruled for four years and murdered nearly two million of its citizens, a quarter of the population. Now, th that's, you know, a million people, two million people, that's very hard to grasp. And, you know, a quarter of the population, that's one in four people. But I want to bring it down uh, an order of magnitude here and talk about a, a specific place, uh, Tool Slang, uh, which uh, used to be a school and became a torture center under the Khmer Rouge, this torture center where up to 16,000 people died, uh, were tortured to death behind barbed wires in uh, classrooms that were turned into torture chambers and um, on beds with medieval torture devices like these, uh, where mothers and their infants, here you see an arm reaching up, uh, were uh, killed. Uh, and uh, children, boys, uh, were told that they were both CIA and KGB all at once, uh, enemies of the state, literally, ending up in killing fields. So I wanted to understand how this happened, and that's why I wrote uh, the book that I did, Aid Dependence in Cambodia, and, and essentially to tell the story of Cambodia after this period of time and what's happened to Cambodia since then. So, so um, Vietnam invades Cambodia in 1979 at the end of the Khmer Rouge period. They kick out the, the Khmer Rouge and put them in the border camp area, border area with Thailand. And the Vietnamese occupy Cambodia for the next decade uh, until 1989. Um, and this essentially becomes a, uh, uh, the, the status quo until the end of the Cold War when uh, on October 23, 1991, the Paris Peace Accords were signed. Now this was the first opportunity uh, for uh, Cambodia to actually come to peace finally with respect to all of its warring factions. So Sihanouk, the head of state you saw earlier, is there in the, in the gray hair clapping at the signing of the accord. And, and, and to the right there is uh, Khieu Sampan, uh, one of the uh, top Khmer Rouge leaders who is currently actually on trial in Cambodia for war crimes. But in 1991, they were together clapping away, signing at the signing of, of this accord, which brought the UN to Cambodia in 1992 and in the largest mission that the UN ever undertook, which cost uh, more than $2 billion, called the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia. And this, this mission, uh, it's funny because, you know, a lot of things happened during this mission. There was an election, but uh, the, there's a museum in Cambodia in, in near the temples of Angkor Wat at the Cultural Center where a depiction of that period of Cambodia's history is, is made in, in, in wax figures. And this is that depiction. Uh, who can tell me what this looks like? What, what is happening here? A UN peacekeeper with anybody? What's happening? Yes. 
you don't know, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with a lady of the night, right? So, so this is the impression that Cambodians, some Cambodians had of what was happening. There's a karaoke bar in the back. Um, and and uh, Richard Holbrook, who is a UN, the U.S. representative to the U.N., visited Cambodia during that time. He wasn't in any official capacity. He saw what was happening. He wrote a letter to this man here, the head of the U.N. mission, uh, Yasushi Akashi, um, to say, you know, great work, but, we're, but I'm really worried about, you know, peacekeepers in brothels, AIDS spreading, and so on. And he never got a response, but uh, Akashi was asked at a press conference, you know, what, what do you think about all this, the, these brothels and your peacekeepers? And he said, boys will be boys. Um, that was his answer to, to the complaint. But that, that was the first sign of, of, of a lack of leadership there, because soon thereafter, the first sign of problems with the UN was that when Akashi and his force commander, his general, uh, faced a bamboo pole with a teenage Khmer Rouge soldier in, in an area where they wanted to access, instead of saying, well, we have, we have every right to be here, you have to lift the, this bamboo pole and let us in, he instead turned back and did not uh, confront the, 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 the teenager and the bamboo pole stayed, stayed in place, which really tells you how little resolve the UN had to stand up to the real problem that, that, that was taking over Cambodia at that time, the resurgence of the Khmer Rouge, attacks by the Khmer Rouge during the early 1990s. Um, the election that uh, the UN oversaw led to the victory of this gentleman on the left there, and the, uh, actually on the, on the right, Prince Ranarit, the son of, of, of Nora Dam Sienuk, and um, he actually had to share power with the existing Prime Minister, Prime Minister Hun Sen, because they wouldn't, well, they wouldn't cede power. And so Prime Minister Hun Sen uh, created with Ranarit the first government that had two prime ministers at the same time. Uh, a first prime minister and a second prime minister with equal powers. Now, if you can think of two lions on top of a mountain, you can imagine what the outcome would be. That essentially, uh, it wouldn't last very long. And within a couple of years, Hun Sen undertakes a coup, and in 1997, actually, uh, the coup uh, takes place. And, and, and while he doesn't take complete control, he replaces Ranarit with somebody else in power. So fast forward to 2000, 2010, basically the last decade, and a few billion dollars later for the economists in the, in the room here, um, I, I want to talk about what happened in terms of foreign aid and sort of the, the picture of of aid dependence that I'll present here. So in Cambodia, for every dollar that the Cambodian government spent between the years actually 2002 and 2010, 94.3 cents was given in foreign aid, in net foreign aid. Now, if you think about that, that's like saying, for every dollar you work uh, and earn for yourself, I, I, will, I will give you another dollar to spend. Uh, the incentive might be, well, you know, not you don't need to work as much because you don't need to earn all your money anymore. And that's, 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 truly, that that's really a problem, a problem of aid dependence. And it's not true just in Cambodia, but also in uh, Africa and other parts of the world. The uh, work of Dembisa Moyo is, is very uh, telling of that in her book, Dead Aid. I just have a few slides here on Africa. Uh, this is uh, the net official aid received as a, percentage of, uh, as a percentage of government expenditure. So if Cambodia was 94.3%, uh, you see that in Africa, there are countries, uh, Liberia, 771%, um, Rwanda, 205%, um, you know, Mozambique, 167%, Madagascar, 194%. Can you imagine what that level of aid dependence would lead to? Uh, as well as, um, you know, good cases or cases of relatively low aid dependence, right? So, so this, this, is, this is fairly interesting. Now, what happens to taxes during this time? Uh, well, the tax revenues in a lot of the developing countries hasn't been catching up, right? So tax collection in low-income countries, in poor countries, is low, obviously. They're not rich, but, you know, they should be collecting more as a percentage, really, than they are currently, than relative to emerging market countries, market economies. And if you look at the picture of uh, revenue collection in general, um, uh, comparing Vietnam, Ghana, Tanzania, Central African Republic, well, you can see that the, the, the picture isn't very, very uh, appealing here. You've got these African countries that are kind of languishing there, and of course Vietnam in the same period of time, 1998 to 2008, goes from about five, six billion dollars in tax 
revenues and domestic revenues to 22 billion. So it's collecting way more and as a result, presumably able to use these resources. And then the relationship with corruption, of course, is that the more aid you receive, the more corruption you can experience. So a lot of African countries getting foreign aid end up having very high rankings or the very bad performers in terms of economic freedom and in terms of corruption perception. So they, they are at the bottom of the list when it comes to getting a lot of, you know, they get a lot of aid and then they end up being very corrupt. But let's, let's return to, to Cambodia and take a closer look at what happens there. So in Cambodia during the period of the early uh, 2000s, you see that um, uh, estimates of corruption uh, are about three to five hundred million dollars. And that kind of money is really significant because it's actually around the amount of money that Cambodia was receiving in terms of foreign aid. And if you think about it, if you could instead take that money and spend it on development as opposed to uh, putting it in your own pocket, you could really make a difference in terms of the development of your country. Uh, what happened in terms of development itself during this period of time? In Cambodia, from 2000 to 2008, maternal mortality, that's the number of mothers that die uh, in a, a child uh, at, at labor, essentially, in delivering their, their child. Out of 100,000, uh, you had 440 in, two th in the year 2000, went up to 470 in 2004, and then went down slightly to 460 in 2008. Uh, that's still higher than what, uh, what the numbers were for 2000, for the year 2000. So it's telling you that actually more mothers are dying uh, from, you know, uh, delivering children from the year 2000 to the year 2008, which is very disturbing when you have an economy that's growing in double digits, so about nearly 10% per year in terms of growth. So where is the money going? Wh what's, what's happening? In terms of inequality, it's getting worse dramatically. So this Gini coefficient measures inequality. And um, a Gini of one says that one person has everything, basically, in the whole country, right? So, so it's thankfully it's not one, but 0 0.38, 0.42 in 2004, and then 0 0.44 in 2007. So the money is getting more concentrated, and Cambodia at this point is on par with the Philippines and the Democratic Republic of the Congo in terms of inequality. What happens at the same time with respect to uh, democracy and to governance in general? If you look at uh, different measures of, of governance, for example, voice and accountability, which one might characterize as democracy or, or political stability or regulatory quality, what you see is basically nothing, nothing is improving. Uh, the, only, the only thing that kind of shows a, an upward trend is political stability. And uh, other than that, really, everything's kind of muddling through. Government effectiveness is decreasing, maybe has a slight pickup at, at from 2006 to 2008. So what's happening with respect to political stability? Well, it's basically explained by this diagram here, and you don't need to see any of the names, really. You just know that the black box in the middle is the prime minister, and all the yellow boxes around are his in-laws uh, running different parts of the government. So, so you have political stability in that sense. You have the, the, the stability of essentially the same people running the government and controlling the resources and, and, and running ministries like private corporations. Uh, so it's very difficult from the standpoint of, of this meta-analysis where you're looking at the big picture to understand what perhaps is happening on the ground. And I want to give you a chance to see in three cases how this uh, argument of mine about foreign aid and, and, and governance uh, takes place. So let me talk about rule of law and what happens to rule of law. So rule of law is case one. Number two is actually a happy story. The garment sector in Cambodia is a success story. Uh, case three is going to be about the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and how that has really gone astray. So let me start with case one and the rule of law. So here I call it the capture of property rights. And it's an example of, uh, of, 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 a, of a lake uh, called Bangkok Lake from the year 2008 to 2012 where 20,000 people lived around the lake and uh, about three to 4,000 families. Um, and this lake is in the center of Phnom Penh, right? So it's the capital city, there's a lake in the middle, and it's, it's beautiful. You go there at sunset, you can have uh, drinks, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a backpacker area, it's, it's really refreshing in a city where it's very hot. Uh, when it rains, uh, the water actually flows to the lake, it's great. Now, what happened was the municipality of Phnom Penh sold the lake to a company that 
was, that's headed by a Cambodian senator, but it's actually backed by Chinese, uh, a Chinese conglomerate, and started filling in the lake to build, uh, to build property on it. So from this perspective, it doesn't look like much, right? So hey, they're filling in the lake, great, more land. But the only way to fill a lake is to pump in mud uh, from the river, which is filling in, uh, which is essentially displacing the water and causing the properties around the lake to get, uh, essentially to, to crumble into the lake and to get flooded. So the people, the 20,000 people who lived around the lake uh, now find themselves homeless, and the lucky ones who were offered $6,000, $7,500 might have, uh, you know, been able to survive a few, few years from that. But the value of properties around the lake is more like $100,000. Now, why do I talk about this as an example of how foreign aid can hurt, um, can hurt uh, development or can hurt governance? Well, actually, the World Bank was involved in this. <coughs> the World Bank had a project during this period of time of land titling, how to give land titles to people so that they could own their property legally. Um, but for whatever reason, the bank was tricked by the municipality to not give land titles to the people who lived around the lake. And that essentially was the reason why the people around the lake never, ne were never able to argue that they deserved actually $100,000 for their property and not $7,000. So they, of course, protested, and of course the protests were met with resistance by the authorities, which then led to uh, you know, violence. And uh, that has continued, it continues to this day. Um, it's just one example. Other parts of Cambodia, there's a, there was last year a young girl named Heng Chanta, 14, who was shot dead by security forces while uh, trying to prevent her family's eviction uh, by security forces. So she was killed, and as a result, uh, you know, I think greater attention is being paid to that, but it's still a terrible situation. Let's look at a success story, the garment sector and what happened in Cambodia. So garments in Cambodia is a huge deal today, but actually in 1994, it was um, a very small part of the economy. It was almost nothing. Uh, and in, uh, today, it's 14% of the economy, provides 350,000 jobs, uh, direct jobs and as many indirect jobs and helps overall a million people. How did this happen? Well, in 1999, the U.S. and Cambodia uh, agreed to link labor tr to trade. So to say essentially that if Cambodia could prove it had better labor standards, it could export more to the U.S. Uh, but how do you do this? A any government is going to say, we have great labor standards, we respect our workers. Uh, how would you believe them when they say that? Well, the only way to do that was to have a third party uh, labor standards monitoring of the garment sector. So somebody else is actually going to look at, 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 at the labor standards in Cambodia and then report on them. And as a result, uh, Cambodia could get more exports, uh, more quota exports to the US. And it actually worked, amazingly enough, because this third party was uh, the United Nations International Labor Organization, and they created a program called Better Factories. So this is an example of a donor or aid program or some sort of donor involvement in a way that actually led to a useful uh, sort of uh, scenario in which, in which uh, for example, you know, they go around 480 checkpoint list about you know, things like compliance with the minimum wage. So 97% compliance with the minimum wage. This is good. It could get better. It should, get, should be 100%. But you know, when they can prove that, that from the uh, visits that they make, things are, are getting better in terms of labor standards, Cambodia gets to export more. Um, but challenges remain. Cambodia, for example, is only focused on something called CMT, cutting fabric, making the garments, and trimming the garments. They don't actually make the fabric, they don't make the buttons, they don't make the threads, they don't make anything that actually goes in it. Everything has to be imported to Cambodia in order to be made into the garment, cut up and made into garment, and sh shipped out. So, they, so there's, there's, very, there, there's value addition, but not nearly enough. Uh, and the, the growth of the garment sector has been tremendous. You see uh, that from you know, 1995, next to nothing, 28 million, it goes to 3 billion in, uh, in 2012. There was a dip, of course, during the Great Recession, but, but it's been a rocket uh, increase. And, and part of the explanation that I, I talk about in, in my book is this idea that, that actually, um, China's involvement, or greater China's involvement in the garment sector might explain how they were able to avoid some of the corruption. 
So in mid-1996, okay, this is, this is the website of, of something called the Garment Manufacturers Association of Cambodia. Uh, there are all the manufacturers got together and, and, and made, uh, made this, uh, this association, this union of manufacturers. So on the website, it actually says this. In mid-1996, most of the garment investors coming from such a diverse background as China, Hong Kong, Macau, Malaysia, and Singapore, uh, I love how diverse this is, uh, decided to form an ad hoc unit to represent them as a group instead of being singled out individually when dealing with officials from the Ministry of Commerce, which has been charged by the Royal Government of Cambodia to oversee the export of garments in the issuance of certificates of origin. So if you read between the lines, they're saying, we got together so we could fight you know, the corruption that we were being asked to pay. And as a result, we could agree to certain things from the government. So in a way, it was the avoidance of capture thanks to greater China, thanks to this commonality they had with one another because they were all at really ethnic Chinese. Um, so uh, in a way, this, this is an example of something called hand-in-hand -hand governance. So one of the garment factory owners uh, described it this way. We negotiate with each government department. You take $10 for inspection instead of 35 We agree. We tell all members of GMAC the cost negotiated is at $10. If you don't accept, I refer you to GMAC. GMAC refers to your boss. Some in the private sector don't want their boss to know because they cheat the boss. But, but the bottom line still is, is, is that essentially they were able to negotiate, I think, for lower corruption levels and as a result get more of the money for their own production uh, as opposed to handing it more to the government. And, and I think it's, a, it's, and it's an example. I, I remember years ago when I visited GMAC, they, had, they even had this idea of a voucher that they could use. Instead of giving the $10, they would give a voucher for $10. And then the government official could come to GMAC and get his $10 there so they could track, you know, they already paid this person. So there's no need to pay this person twice, right? So, so of course it didn't work because nobody wants to make it official in that way. Like there's real corruption and we're going to have a voucher for your corruption. But at least they, they thought about it at some point. Um, the third case, the, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, and, and this is an example of something called norm penetration. So uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, international lawyers talk about how a tribunal like this in Cambodia is about getting Western standards of justice into a country that is completely messed up, uh, impunity it reigns, you know, uh, judicial standards aren't respected. How do you get Western standards in? You do norm penetration. You bring in your standards and you show them how it's done. Well, I argue that it's gone terribly wrong. Actually, the opposite has happened. The corruption in Cambodia has, has infected the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. And the example of that is in terms of how this man here, who headed, actually his name is Doik, he headed that torture center I talked about earlier with the 16,000 people who died, right? So Doik was the, the director of this torture center. He confessed in 2009 uh, about what he did, and he was actually found guilty um, in uh, 2000, I think, 11, uh, in the deaths of at least 12,273 people, uh, sentenced to 35 years, reduced to 19 for time already served and some technicalities. Uh, and then he wasn't happy with that. You know, 12,000 people dead, 19 years, he wanted less. So he appealed. Uh, the prosecution also appealed, and thankfully, Doig lost and ended up sentenced to life in prison. But it was, there was a period of time when the man could, in theory, have gone to prison and walked out still alive after all this. And now you compare that to this gentleman here. How many of you are familiar with this guy? Yes, who is he? Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff right? So Bernie got 150 years for uh, bilking uh, people out of money, right? So he didn't kill anybody, technically. Uh, he did cause I think it's less now than $65 billion. I think it, it, it's, it turned out to be less than what people thought, but still billions of dollars. He's not appealing. And you have to think about who the real monster is in this case, you know. Uh, Bernie Madoff or a Doig character. And, and the judge in the case of Bernie Madoff, Denny Chin, um, uh, was quoted in the New York Times as, well, the New York Times described his thinking as the following. Uh, judge Denny Chin, um, noted that 20 or 25 years would effectively have been a life sentence, but he reasoned that the symbolism of the longer term was important given the enormity of the crimes. Um, and you have to think about what you know, the enormity of the crimes means anymore when, 
on the one hand, you're just talking about money, and on the other, you're talking about actual people's lives. Um, this woman here, who used to be the social affairs minister under the Khmer Rouge, uh, was on trial at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal and uh, was released, actually, uh, a few months ago because she was found to have Alzheimer's. And so her family picked her up and brought her home. And, uh, you know, I, I have a personal stake in this because my father passed away un in, a, in a Khmer Rouge hospital, quote-unquote, and that would have probably been managed by this, this woman as Minister of Social Affairs. So, so it, it's really um, strange to see that. Of course, technically they say that if she should get better, she could be brought back into the tribunal. But um, that usually doesn't happen with Alzheimer's. Um, her husband, who used to be uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Yang Tirit, uh, died uh, about a month ago at age 87. He was also on trial, and uh, he will never face justice. In fact, uh, it's possible that he had you know, a bank account in Hong Kong with 20 million U.S. dollars in it, money that could have been used to compensate the victims in some ways, m very marginally, but, you know, but because he died before being found guilty, he died innocent. Uh, that's, you know, presumed innocent, right? So, so how do you deal with this in all its context? I have to go back to sort of the wisdom of, of my late mother who, who passed away in 2009 and who saved 20 lives. So she saved her, uh, her five children, and then the five children had 15 more kids. Uh, and I put in, in, in red here a boy and a girl because uh, my son and my daughter are in there. Um, and, and what sort of thinking she would have had uh, were she alive. Well, she certainly was Buddhist, so she believed in, in this idea of what goes around comes around, that basically uh, the, the people who had done harm to our family would, would end up hurting themselves, really. And that uh, as a Buddhist, she believed in karmic justice. So maybe, if not in this lifetime, they'd be reborn cockroaches in the next. And perhaps she was able to forgive the fact that there wasn't justice in her lifetime because she could know that in Buddhism, in the karmic justice, there would be justice in a future life. So I would say that perhaps in, uh, for the 14 million Cambodians living today in Cambodia, Buddhism gives them at least the solace uh, in, in, in seeing that despite the lack of justice in their lives, despite the, the, the interminable impunity that goes around them, that there can be, uh, after all, maybe metaphysical justice in another life. Let me close with, with this quote here from, from my book. And, and it's really, it's, uh, how many of you saw the Coney 2012 video, right? Uh, most of you did. I mean, it made such, a, such waves, right? So I was finishing up the book, and I wrote about how, you know, in 20 days at the time, it had been seen 85 million times. And uh, this, the author, Teju Cole, uh, an African, uh, had written in, in The Atlantic, I think, the, the following, that there's much more to doing good work than, quote, making a difference. There's the principle of first do no harm. There's the idea that those who are being helped ought to be consulted over the matters that concern them. And in a way, I think this brings up the, the idea of, of a, perhaps a Hippocratic oath, a first do no harm oath that doctors uh, take, maybe in development work, uh, which, which would be undergirded by commitment to genuine participation. So that's, that's my humble sort of suggestion as to how we might proceed in terms of of, of interventions in the future, how we might instead ask, you know, are we doing more harm sometimes when we intervene than, than good? Uh, of course, it's hard to say, but I, I hope that, that by asking the question, it might make a difference. So, thank you very much. The kids are well, um, and uh, uh, I hope uh, you'll have plenty of questions for me. I know the, t the first one is tough. Yes. Yeah, I got one. Um, you brought up, it looked like a graph or a chart talking about um, basically uh, death rate of mothers. Is that correct? Uh, yes, maternal mortality rate. I'll bring it up here so that we can, um, yeah. Certainly I'm not a statistics person, but I've heard that through the development of more medical resources being available and giving birth being medicalized, that the generally actually the birth or the death rate goes up for these women. Right. Well, um, certainly in terms of, you know, if, if, if development means using formula 
and formula means uh, using water, and water is not clean, then it can mean death for the baby, right? So you're mixing dirty water with formula that you then feed the child, and they're dying of waterborne diseases. That would be really messed up, and it happens. And actually, the solution would be what everyone, at least in the West, now recognizes, which is breastfeeding. Hey, nothing better than breast milk for the baby, right? So I think you know, there are unintended consequences in that sense. Of course, Nestle would probably disagree, and, 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 and they're out there selling their, 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 their formulas, but, but it, it, it's, it's part of the whole get back to work, be, you know, it's very difficult to breastfeed when you're working, et cetera. And so, but I think for Cambodian, for in this case, this is not a, a, um, a problem with, um, with, with, with formula. It's, it's a problem with, with I think, the, the availability of health care for, for women. And if it, if it is getting worse as a result of, of new practices that aren't being uh, undertaken properly, then, then that, that would be a huge concern. Now, you know, I think the general pattern, though, aside from this, is that other statistics like infant mortality, child mortality, literacy, actually, uh, and, and poverty were showing either getting worse or stagnating for a long time, even, even during this period of time. And then suddenly, when I went back into the database of the World Bank to look up the same numbers again before I finalized the book, they changed. All the numbers were, 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 were corrected to show an improvement over the same period of time. Now, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, but I do think that the narrative of, of, of a donor involved in an exercise where billions of dollars um, have been spent and taxpayers demand accountability, right, uh, would, would be very, there'd be an incentive to show that actually we have shown improvement in, in, these, in these variables. Uh, I guess the only one they couldn't muck around with was maternal mortality. Um, but even in terms of poverty, for example, the way that they did it was really disturbing. So, so they couldn't change the figures. What they did, well, they did change the figures. What they did was, in 1994, they had originally said, you know, poverty was 40% or whatnot. They went back and said, no, poverty was like 59%. And so it was much higher back in 94, and so now you'd see this really steep decline in poverty, right? And I, and I have to wonder, like, how do you know poverty was so much higher in 94, like 10, 20 years later? Um, how is it possible that you can do backward projection? Well, you rationalize it as we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get into certain parts of the country. There were lots of Khmer Rouge there. But if you talk to the people who lived in those areas uh, or look at interviews of, of Khmer Rouge during that period of time, they actually had, you know, access to timber, gems, and all these things. They had, they had money coming in. So it's, it seems very strange that, no, 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 in fact, they were much worse off there. Um, but that's, that's, that's up to the statisticians. Of course, there are lies, damn lies in statistics, right? So, yeah. Uh, I'd be careful, of course, of all the numbers I've even shown you here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and then you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering, um, you, you mentioned that aid to foreign countries is, is causing issues. Um, they might not be good for independence. Um, what do you think of micro loans? Are they a useful form of aid? So I, I just remembered that I was asked that I should repeat the question every time so that it can get recorded. So you're asking about micro loans as opposed to foreign aid. Yeah, I, you, look, I, you know, generally I think that, that, that micro credit has been touted as sort of a, uh, a panacea for a lot of problems, but I think we're realizing that. Microcredit can only go so far. So if you are really poor, are you going to go and get a loan? Uh, you might not get a microcredit loan. You would go to a loan shark and get a loan because you really badly need the money, but it would not be, I think, to create a business or something. So, so what, we, what we know now, of course, is that, is that the poorest of the poor are not the clients of microcredit. Okay, they're, they're the ones, um, the people who are clients of microcredit already have some assets, because usually microcredit doesn't work on the basis of, of uh, yeah, you don't have to give us any uh, collateral or anything like that. No, actually in Cambodia at least, you have to put a, a deed on your property and give them title and so on so that they can uh, access your, uh, you know, get, gain access, to your, take over your house if you don't pay back. Uh, that's, that's, that's a difficult situation oftentimes, and the rates, um, you know, should be market-driven, uh, but but yes, so um, 
it works. I think it, it works in, in, in certain cases, but it's not going to be the answer to, you know, let's just convert everything to microcredit. Again, because if you're trying to get at the poorest, you're not going to get them through microcredit. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question was, you mentioned China was, had created this partnership in the region with many different countries and so forth in terms of the garment trade and, and uh, that's been blossoming, helping the GDP and so forth. Um, in what I've read, China is usually interested in a country because of its exploding uh, population and movement into inner cities. But they're very interested in more resource uh, rich areas uh, in order to sustain and build their uh, currently uh, growing rapidly growing economy and uh, so my question would be what if any sorts of resources can Cambodia offer China not to say that China would exploit them because they actually create a partnership which is mm -hmm. prevalent you know everywhere from Africa to South America but right. uh, how that might be happening if it well so uh, so your question is how is China uh, essentially uh, having, what is China's relationship with countries like Cambodia and what, are, what is each getting from the other? And, I, 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 and, and in the context of the example I gave with garments, actually I should clarify that it isn't China, right? So it's not the country of China, it's not the government of China, it's Greater China. So Greater China is this term that's used to represent people who come from China but live in other places, not necessarily just the mainland, but they, they're in Hong Kong, they're in Taipei, they're in Singapore, uh, they're in Macau, and they are part of that ethnic Chinese identity that, that allows them to be called Greater China. Some people dispute that there's even this Greater China idea, but, but uh, so, that, so it's not a government thing. It's not a Chinese government is doing the garment sector a favor in Cambodia. But in terms of the relationship between China and Cambodia, what you see is, is you know, a very utilitarian uh, situation where one is giving aid and buildings and and roads, building roads and so on for Cambodia. And on the other hand, Cambodia is expected to uh, provide land concessions, uh, sell this lake uh, in the middle of the city, uh, become a kind of farm for, Cambodia, uh, for China's um, uh, consumers. Um, <coughs> so it, it's, 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 a, it's a give and take. Politically, there's even greater concern, I think, in terms of what uh, China has been able to extract from Cambodia in terms of you know, a few years ago, um, there were 20 Uyghurs who ended up in Cambodia. Uyghurs are these uh, Muslim minorities uh, from China, uh, from Xinjiang. And they somehow ended up in uh, Cambodia, and they were trying to get refugee status so they could leave Cambodia. Uh, well, before they could even get that, the day before Xi Jinping, who's now uh, president of China, arrived in Cambodia, they were flown on a plane back to China, and you know, to probably their deaths or in prisons or whatnot. And uh, Xi Jinping signed $1.2 billion worth of, of aid and investment for Cambodia the next day. So it was a very sort of quid pro quo, I'll, you know, you do this, I'll do that. And then recently in the last year with the dispute over the South China Seas and the oil there and neighboring countries like Vietnam, uh, arguing with China and the Philippines arguing with China over, over territorial disputes, Cambodia, which chaired ASEAN, was more than willing to say, oh, well, you know, this is China's view. But you're not representing China, but, you know, this, th basically to become a, a spokesperson for China as if China were in the room speaking through Cambodia. And that, that pissed off a lot of, the, of, of Ase uh, other ASEAN member countries that, that felt that Cambodia had betrayed ASEAN by doing that. So I think it's something that Brunei, which is now chairing ASEAN, is, is avoiding studiously. Bob, yes. Um, are leaving, I know. So what I'm going to suggest is, first of all, that we thank him. And if you want to stay and ask additional questions, you can. He's going to need to go to the airport fairly soon, but I think he has like 10 more minutes to hang out. So um, why don't we all thank him for coming. Thank you. And I do have copies of the book if you're interested in buying them. Uh, just, I don't want to carry them back if I don't have to, but you're not forced to buy them. No way. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. I know this 
here about relative levels of corruption in countries, and you had a graphic on it. How do you measure corruption? Right. So how do you measure corruption when it's a very culturally um, sort of bound a thing, right? So it's a perception thing. Oftentimes, corruption is, is, is so uh, when, you go, when, you, when you look at um, perceptions of corruption, let's say, let me go to that slide, in fact, uh, you see that essentially the people are being asked for their view of, you know, do you believe that uh, corruption is getting worse, the same or, 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 or better? Um, and so I think that the key there is, is they're going to experts to ask them about their views of corruption. So uh, here, if I can get it up, uh, here the uh, Corruption Perception Index for 2009 it's, it's, it's based on, on saying, hey, you know, is, uh, from an expert, uh, it's an expert in Guinea-Bissau, uh, an expert on Mozambique, you know, tell us whether you think things are getting worse and so on. So they're asking experts this. And oftentimes, um, the, the problem is, is it comparable across countries? Uh, corruption in, a, in one country might be considered gift-giving in another. You know, it seems to be standard to to you know, bring something for your host. Now, is that something, uh, an envelope full of cash, or is it, you know, a pen, or what exactly is it, and and how much do you actually have to pay? Well, um, there's the argument certainly that that corruption is a, is something that is cultural and therefore cannot be, you know, measured in a, in a way that that that's comparable across countries. Um, but I think you know the old argument of you need a little corruption to make the squeaky wheel turn is one that the IMF used to make and has abandoned, which, which basically says that, you know, in order to expedite things, maybe you should pay some money and make it work faster and so on. Um, that, that is a slippery slope that then leads to, you know, maybe we should pay for everything and then maybe those who have money should pay more and those who have less should just wait in line and then it makes society very unequal as a result. Let me just tag on to that real quick. Does the U.S. show up on there? Because if you think of political finance, campaign finance, yeah, you should make a pretty strong argument that that's just another form of corruption. And at least it's transparent, right? So it, it's you go to a website and plug in the name, and then you get you get how much money was paid. Um, uh, yeah, yes. With the super PACs, it's it's become less, uh, more, much more opaque, certainly. And I agree. Look. You know, look, uh, the, when I talk to the children of politicians in Cambodia, the invariable answer I get is, well, there's corruption everywhere. So, but then the argument seems to be a moral equivalent. So there's corruption there, there's corruption there, so don't, don't pick on us because we're just like everybody else. And then you get into, well, are you really like everybody else or are you trying to basically blend in and look like you're like everybody else? So um, thinking beyond Cambodia, but sure. to bring it back to Cambodia, can you think, I don't know how far you have to go back, of an example or examples of foreign aid that has occurred that has been very successful, right. modestly successful, sure. that in, your, in, in recent memory? So, uh, okay, so successful examples of, of foreign aid. Uh, you've got Taiwan, South Korea, uh, you have uh, Singapore, and not literally foreign aid in that sense, but if you read uh, Lee Kuan Yew's, um, you know, from first world to from third world to first world, the, the Singapore story, uh, he talks about this guy that he met from the UN Development Program, who was a, an engineer in Germany, and every six months he would invite him to come back to Singapore and give him ideas. So foreign aid that instead of uh, you know representing huge infusions of money, instead maybe you need to have a receptive somebody who's willing to listen to you, first of all, and, t and maybe implement the ideas that, you prov that they provide. But that's, that's an example of where he says, this guy was you know, so valuable to us because I could bounce ideas off of him and he would always you know, tell me what he thought independently and, and it, it didn't have to be, um, you know, uh, he wasn't like an advisor paid to come constantly, to, to be there and to live there and to essentially uh, uh, no longer be independent. Um, in, in South Korea, the dictator of that country at one point, Park Chung-hee, uh, had a billboard that, um, that, uh, that, that was outside the airport that said, export or die. Uh, and that was his idea of telling his people, you know, you can't rely on foreign aid forever. You have to export to make foreign exchange so that we can 
develop as a country. Uh, I'm not advocating dictatorship, by the way. I'm just saying that this guy at least was sending the message to his people, you know, find money on your own. Don't just wait for Hannah. I know you're still waiting for ex uh, your, your example of success, but I think in, in Taiwan, <laughs> In Taiwan, there was land reform there, and I think generally it worked nicely. So if you can do land reform, of course, nobody's willing to do land reform because land reform means reallocating assets in ways that, 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 that makes people very uncomfortable, people who have held on to those assets for a long time. The Philippines, for example, would never do land reform because the Philippines is a place where, uh, you know, the people who've owned the land for hundreds of years, generations, are not willing to cede control of that land, and that's how they get more and more rich and fly around in helicopters instead of, you know, driving cars. I think you, you had wanted to ask something. Well, I lost it. I broke the mic. Okay. <laughs> right. Gosh. Okay. Yes, a, a woman, finally. Yes. Uh, when I was in Cambodia in 2007, we saw several um, NGOs working there, and they seemed to be the only ones that were doing any development. I mean, in the education, in demining, in uh, dealing with the amputees, and um, because all the money that was going to the, the government was obviously not going anywhere to do any of the development. Right. Is that still the case? Uh, are NGOs still being effective there? Um, is the government allowing them to function, and are they making a real difference? Okay, so NGOs. Uh, were the, one, were the entities you saw, they seemed effective, are they still there, so are they still effective? I'm just repeating for the camera. So um, I, I think that, that, so NGOs in Cambodia are really, they, they face the problem uh, of, the, of the Samaritan's dilemma, right? So the NGOs feel like they need to do something because if they don't do anything, people are gonna starve to death, people are not gonna get uh, educated, people are not gonna move forward in their lives. So in a way, they're kind of replacing the government in terms of providing services which then only encourages the government to then say, well, that's, that, we don't even have to worry about that. Somebody else is going to take care of that. So, um, so, so it's a challenge. It's a challenge where, you know, there's this hospital uh, chain in Cambodia by uh, the Swiss doctor named Beat Rickner. Um, it, it, it provides great, uh, it's a children's hospital. It provides great care for children. It costs millions of dollars to operate. He, out, he apparently gets all that money from Switzerland. And the, in the past year, he's had some problems financing it. And so um, is it sustainable? And shouldn't, in fact, the government be providing the resources, the tax resources that it collects towards running hospitals that provide free care? Now, the, the other question is, you know, should, you, should, should care be free? Should it be charged? Who should pay? Should some people pay? Should some people not pay? That's a, that's a political economy question that, that each country has to answer for themselves. But, but, but the model, the, the, the work that, that the Swiss doctor is doing is, is, is critical. It's saving lives, but, but at the same time, it's enabling the government to say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about those kids. They're going to be taken care of by uh, Rickner's hospital. Yeah. Yes? Um, kind of talking about foreign aid, um, is the foreign aid that Cambodians, you know, have received or the corruption comparable to the foreign aid that U.S. has received recently for the Great Reception from China? I mean... Oh, I, so so the foreign aid in Cambodia compared to foreign aid that the U.S. is receiving? What, I'm sorry, what kind of foreign aid is the U.S. receiving? You mean the, the, the treasury, the, the, the sale of, of U.S. bonds? Okay, that's, those are not ac actually... That, well, okay, so, so th that would be like... The, U, the Chinese are, are, are lending money to the U.S. because the U.S. issues these IOUs that say, you know, if you take this, we have this money that we'll give to you. And, and the U.S. actually prints that money. So it's able to, to, to have enough confidence in the world uh, and, and by, by the Chinese to say, uh, you know, we, we trust you that you're not suddenly going to turn on the machine and print a whole bunch of money and, and, and the dollar is going to be worthless. Uh, but, uh, but it is a significant amount of resources that China has, has uh, essentially lent to the U.S. by saying, hey, we, we, we'll, we will buy this, this paper and, and it's not paying any interest, by the way. It's like 0% interest. But because we believe so much in your economy, uh, we, uh, we want to signal that... Uh, that uh, <coughs> it's okay, we'll take it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll hang on to it. Uh, well, you know, it's like, it's, 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 
there's a circular logic to this because uh, who's buying the stuff that the Chinese are making? The Walmarts of this world that are frequented by Americans who, who then help the Chinese economy develop by a process of continuing to buy more things from China, which then means that in order to have that money, you have to lend it to the U.S. to, uh, to essentially continue spending. <laughs> so, okay, I think I've been ignoring the side, but yes, are you saying we, I've got to stop? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a very... Thank you.